Hello, everyone. This is Tim with Online Big Blue, bringing you the best in New York Giants sports talk and entertainment. Well, we got our coach, and we are going to just jump into a new topic. We're going to do a series here, three videos. Uh, we were going to break down the roster a little bit more, but you know what? We, we see some other things on YouTube that people are trying to break down the rosters, but you don't have an O coordinator, you don't have a D coordinator, you can't sit there and judge talent and who would fit and who would not fit the scheme until you have a scheme. So we're going to stay away from that. What we're going to do is we are going to, in this episode, we are going to rank the skill positions in reference to wide receivers and running backs in the NFC East. And we are going to jump right into what we are going to do, and we are going to look at the quarterbacks. Well, this episode, like I said, we'll be looking at the quarterbacks and the running backs. We are going to be mainly looking at uh, the quarterbacks as the starting quarterbacks, not the backups. And running backs, we are going to be looking at the number one and number two running back, and we are going to rank them uh, in the NFC East. And like I said, and we are always going to be comparing it to the Giants. So, jumping into the quarterback situation, we are going to start at number four. And I think everyone knows what number four and who number four is going to be. It's going to be Dwayne Haskins. Dwayne Haskins out of Ohio State. All the promise, all the circumstance around him. Wanting to be a giant, not getting picking to, not getting picked by the giant. Dropping all the way down to the Redskins. Well, you know what? He kind of had a weird start to his everything. He kind of had a, you know, between, you know, with... With the coach not, you know, really being on his side, I think he was not the. I'm not even going to get into the coach's name because you know what, I think he's an idiot. But he didn't want Haskins. The owner wanted Haskins, and then he tried to show up the owner by playing Haskins against the Giants after Keenum got hurt, and Haskins was not ready. He he didn't go through the playbook. He did not go through anything else. It wasn't until Callahan came over and took over the team and the interim basis that. We really got to see what Dwayne Haskins was. Now, Dwayne Haskins, of course, only threw the ball 203 times for uh, 1,365 yards, only complete 58% of his passes, seven touchdowns, seven interceptions. Not a bad, not a bad start. And one of the issues that he had was he was sacked 29 times for a loss of 204 yards and had a quarterback rating of only 76.1. I was not a Haskins fan. I did not want Haskins. Some of the problems that I see with Haskins is he is what I like to refer to as a lollipop thrower on his deep pass. Basically, what that means is if you take a look at Haskins on his pro day and compare him to someone like Kyler Murray, Haskins throws the ball with such a large arc that the wide receivers are usually running under the pass. He's not hitting his wide receivers in stride. If you looked at Kyler Murray, Kyler Murray would hit his wide receivers in stride on the deep ball. You could see it. I mean, it's, it's, it's go back and watch the film. I mean, it's, it's just the way it is. Now, do I think Haskins will progress in year two? I do think he will. I think he will move forward. I still think he is a project quarterback. And I think that's why Callahan did not really just when Callahan took over an interim base, didn't just throw him in. Um, I, I mentioned before, he reminds me a little bit of a Kiwi Smith, um, the bust over in Cincinnati, um, kind of the same type of player, same type of size, same type of speed. Haskins does have a large motion. Um, he's, he's not always fluid in the pocket. And like I said, for a big man, He's not that fast. I mean, he he can once he gets going downhill, he can get going. He did run for over 100 yards at five yards a pop. But you know, I I think once defenses figure him out a little bit more, he is not going to have that type of cushion to run anymore. And like I said, he needs to move up on his accuracy, and he needs to really start looking through his progressions from the games that we saw. And we have Direct TV uh, Sunday tickets, so we watch all the games, especially the NFC East games. He was he was locking on his primary a lot, and uh, he was looking to dump it out of the backfield as well quite a bit. So we are going to move him. He is going to be number four. Number three on our list is going to be your favorite and my favorite it is going to be Daniel Jones. Daniel Jones, what can you say about Daniel Jones out of Duke? I was I was a Duke Jones fan from the beginning. I'm not ashamed to say it. You can go back to listen to any of our podcasts. Uh we did want Josh Allen. We thought Jones could be later in the draft, but that's neither here nor there. But as a rookie season, he had his ups, he had his downs, but he really turned it around in the latter part of the season. 
I mean, we're looking at him throwing for over 3,027 yards, 61% completions, 24 touchdowns, 12 interceptions. Again, sacked 38 times. One of his biggest issues, and I've been saying this for a long time, is he does not have blindside awareness. He doesn't feel the rush yet. And that is something that will come with time. But his problem is, like I said, he just does not feel the rush as he should. Eli Manning, and we all got a little, um, I think we all got a little, uh, you know, with Eli, it's, it was just kind of expected. Eli had the sense in the pocket when he was a rookie. And we've gone over that before, that Eli was only sacked a few times as a rookie compared to when he took over for Kurt Warner. You know, and Jones doesn't have that yet. But what Jones does have is Jones has the presence for avoiding the interception. He does have an issue with the fumbles, as we know, and that is something that he can be that he can correct, but he is not uh, there were times at the end of the season that he was trying to force the ball in, but I think he was trying to make plays. But he does not have that propensity to throw the big interception, which is great. Which, you know, you throw the ball 459 times, you only throw 12 INTs at a you know interception ratio of 2.6. I mean, you're doing pretty well. I mean, he did have a nice core of receivers when they were healthy. It was just hard to get them all on the field at the same time between you know Darius and Golden and Sterling and Barkley out of the backfield. But I think when he is going to go, and we have did a video also on it as well, I think he is going to make a huge jump going into year two. And I see nothing but big things for our man, Daniel Jones. Now, number two on the list. <sighs> number two on the list is going to be Philadelphia's Carson Wentz. Carson, a big kid. He's got some mobility still. He's got, he's got some wheels. He's got the accuracy at 63.9%. He's, he, again, is another one that does not throw a tremendous amount of interceptions, seven interceptions and over 607 passes. He goes through his progressions well. He does have a tendency, like Jones, to hold on to the ball a little too long. He took 37 sacks. But you know what? He's a tried-and-true player. His problem is he can't stay healthy. If he could stay healthy and put it together like he did, like he was doing during their Super Bowl run before he got hurt and Foles came in and wrecked it for him by winning the Super Bowl, he is going to be the man. I mean, he is just, like I said, he's got the size, he's got the strength, he's got the accuracy. I hate having him in the East with us, but you know what? If he ever got a complete complimentary of receivers... He could be nothing but phenomenal. He he could be young Tom Brady in the East. Um, and like I said, Doug Peterson is the perfect coach for him. And I just think that the way he plays, that is, uh, like I said, if he could stay on the field, that is that is his biggest bugaboo. If he could stay on the field, he is going to be a force for years to come. Now, number one on our list, and it pains me to say it, is Dak Prescott. The Dak Meister. Dak Meister General. <sighs> you know, you either love Dak or you hate Dak. I personally think he is a fantastic quarterback. Is he worth the 30 to $40 million a year he's looking for? Hell no. But was Eli worth, worth his second contract or his third contract that he received from the Giants? Hell no. It was what the market dictated. Now, Dak threw for almost 5,000 yards, 4,902 yards, completed 65% of his passes, 30 touchdowns, 11 interceptions, the interception ratio 1.8, only sacked 23 times. And of course, with that line, I would probably only get sacked 40 times, and I have no mobility whatsoever. He has the accuracy. He has the poise in the pocket. He has the wheels when needed. Um, again, he also rushed for 277 yards and three touchdowns. So you know what? He is the player in Dallas. Is he Roger Staubach, or is he going to be Danny White? To me, he, Danny White was a good quarterback, but Danny Knight White could never win the big game. And right now, neither could Tony Romo. And right now, that's where we're heading with Dak. Dak has a propensity that when he is pressured, or when he is put in the big spot, he has folded like a cheap tent in the wind. Uh, and I think that's his biggest issue right now. I mean, talent-wise, yeah, I mean, I think with the new offensive coordinator receivers and Cooper and Gallup, 
Um, we'll see if they sign Cooper or see what happens with that. Like I said, I don't think Witten's going to come back, but Cobb was a nice pickup too. And he, even Zeke can catch the ball out of the backfield. He had 50 something catches. I think that Dak, if given the, the opportunity is going to wreck the NFC East. I think the NFC East and that even counts as Washington is going to be the place to be for quarterbacks. I mean, I think that really is. I mean, you take a look at it. You got Dak, you got Wentz, you got Jones and, like I said, Haskins is still a project, but I really think that Haskins is going to move forward. But like I said, our top four, starting from the bottom, are going to be, like I said, Dwayne Haskins, Daniel Jones in third, Carson Wentz in second, and the Dak Meister is number one. Now we're going to jump into the running back situation. The running back situation is going to be fun. We all know what number four is going to be. Number four is going to be... The Washington Redskins. Now, again, we're looking at the talent that's currently on the roster, not the talent that is going to be, that could possibly be in 2011. And when your workhorse, again, is old man river, Adrian Peterson, running for 898 yards and 4.3 yards of carry, long, but his five touchdowns, and my problem is his longest run was only 32 yards, you got some issues. They need to find a feature back. Rivera, I mean, they're probably going to pick one up in the draft. Or they're going to try to find someone in free agency. I think Derrick Henry is a free agent, so I don't think he's going anywhere. But um, like I said, when you got Old Man River, who can who he's he's got his ability to juke and cut. His front line speed is no longer there. Um, his backups was was a, was a Geis who got hurt. He was a good back. We'll see if he comes back for his injuries. He just did rush for 245 yards at 5.8 yards a carry. Longest run was up 60. And he has uh, Chris Thompson behind him on there. And, you know, Chris Thompson was a surprise that they did not run him as much as I thought they would. He is another player that I think fell into the doghouse of the coach that we shall not name. Um, and it wasn't until Callahan came in that even towards the last two weeks of the season, they really started using him not just out of the backfield. So you know what, it's, it's, they have, you know, I don't want to say you have nothing, but they don't have anything right now that makes you go, wow. <sighs> Number three on this list, and I think most people are going to be surprised by this, is the, are the Dallas Cowboys. You're saying to me, Tim, have you lost your mind? How can they be number three? Well, you think about it this way. They got Mr. Ezekiel Elliott, who ran for 1357 yards, 4.5 yards of carry, 12 touchdowns. And he also would caught out of the backfield 54 passes for 420 yards. Great stats. Fantastic stats. And you got Tony Pollard right behind him for 455 yards at 5.3 yards of carry. Problem is, neither of them have the breakaway speed right now. <sighs> Out of 301 carries, we're looking at the longest run of Ezekiel Elliott is 33 yards. Tony Pollard's the same thing, 44 yards. Tony is not what I would refer to as a gazelle catching out of the backfield. I think Zeke does well. He had 54 catches, like I said. But if I'm looking at, you know, like I said, to me, it's not only just the talent on the front end, it's the talent on the back end as well. While Zeke is a fantastic back, I mean a phenomenal all-world back, he got his money from Jerry Jones, which is surprising. But like I said, I, I, I would like to see more breakaway speed from him. I know, you, you know you're going to have to feed him quite a bit to get him going. He's a downhill runner. And you know what? He he gets stronger as the game goes on. But like I said, it it to me, there are two other teams ahead of him that have a little bit more going on. I think number two on the list, and like I said, most people are going to be surprised by this again. It is the New York football giants. Saquon Barkley. To me, all world. He got hurt. Of course, we know that. You know, he missed a bunch of games. He never was really healed, all right, and I really thought he came back from his injury. But he still ran for 1,003 yards at 4.6 yards a carry for six touchdowns and then caught another 52 passes out of the backfield. He did not have the stats for the pass catching in the backfield that you would think he would have, but again, I think that was a lot of the way, way Pat Shermer used him. Uh, he kept him in 
he kept him in the block. Quite, and I understand you have a rookie quarterback, but you kept him in the block quite a bit, Shermer. I think that's one of the reasons you got canned. I mean, think about it right now. You kept him in the block. I mean, you, you didn't use him as an outlet for Daniel Jones just to dump it off. I mean, I know Daniel Jones like looking down the field, but, you know, you got a, you got a back that's got that. We've seen it to, when he was getting healthy the last couple of games of the season with the breakaway speed and the power. And he, he's, he's everything. He's all world. Now, one of the reasons why I put them number two on the list is Wayne Gallman. I have no idea why Wayne Gallman fell off the face of the earth with, with Shermer. Wayne Gallman, when he came in to fill in for, for Barkley, had a fantastic first game. He went into per, uh, concussion protocol, and then it seems like we never saw him again. And I'm not upset about that because he was on my fantasy football team after Barkley got hurt. But he has the vision. He has the speed. He has the ability when needed to catch the ball out of the backfield. He could be a well-rounded back for us. But the problem is, like I said, they didn't really use him. So, and I don't know why, and I'm hoping that Coach Judge, whoever his offense coordinator comes in, takes a look at the situation and goes, you know what, we really need to start using Wayne Gallman some more. We need, he, he is a fantastic setup back for our boy Barkley. I would like to see them get um, somewhat more of a third down back. I know Barkley is a third down back, but I'd like to see another third down back come out, a little scat back, a uh, little Tony Colbreth coming out of the backfield, if anyone remembers that. If, if you remember that and you are still watching this, you leave a comment about Tony Galbraith, and I will send you an online Big Blue coffee mug. Um, so, I mean, I think that's where we are with that. And number one on our list, what I think is going to shock the world, is the Philadelphia Eagles. Why is the Philadelphia Eagles number one on this list? Because the Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Eagles do not have one back. They have one, two, three, four, and a mobile quarterback. They have Miles Sanders, who came in and shocked the world for 600, or how many yards? He, oh, geez, he had 818 yards at 4.6 yards a carry. With the speed and the breakaway power at 65 yards is as long as running three touchdowns. I like to call him Baby Barkley 2.0 since he was also with Barkley over in Penn, at Penn State. Then if that's not enough, when healthy, they throw in Jordan Howard, the bull from that came over from Chicago. What a back. And when healthy, he is a downhill runner that can just knock you in the teeth and they can turn around and take Miles Sanders and just pitch it out and watch him run. Now, that's not bad enough. We got to throw in Boston Scott. Boston Scott is another back. If healthy, can really turn the corner. He did have five touchdowns on only 50, or excuse me, 61 carries. And then on top of that, Darren Sproles, if he comes back. It's like, oh, my God, there is back after back after back. And then if that's not worse, uh, worse who is the third leading rusher on the team? Carson Wentz at 243 yards, almost four yards a pop. They have the ability to throw, like their defensive line, Doug Peterson has the ability to throw waves of running backs at you. Waves of running backs. So that's why I'm putting them number one on the list. So again, number four is, again, drumroll, the Washington Redskins. Number three, and I think most people are going to be shocked by it, is the Dallas Cowboys. And then number two is the New York Giants. And number one is the Philadelphia Eagles. So that is our list. Next time, we are going to be doing offensive linemen and the receiving positions, both tight ends and wide receivers. This is Tim with Online Big Blue bringing you the best in New York Giants sports talk and entertainment. Thanks for listening.